within Vancouver, at least in Canada, I think that we can move beyond uh, supervised injection as a um, experiment or a pilot and say that it's a standard of care. And uh, certainly when you have the level of evidence that we have, it, uh, I think there's a compelling case for that. But before I do that, I want to just tell you a little bit about the neighborhood that we work within. The downtown east side of Vancouver is an extremely demonized neighborhood. This is the front page of our major newspaper, the Vancouver Sun. It's describing it as four blocks of hell. So just to kind of put it in context, um, I think you have to understand the neighborhood and where we were. And the other part that we're particularly interested in and something I wanted to try to share with you today is how do you get these things done? Like if you actually decide that the evidence epidemiologically indicates that you need to have supervised injection, how do you get it done? And so I'm going to provide some comments on that, at least from our experience of the last 20 years. And part of that, in my view, is to address the kind of implicit and explicit values that underlie our understandings of addiction. And, and essentially by that, I'm, I'm talking about uh, looking at culture and our cultural understandings of uh, of the issues. <clears throat> These are some slides that show newspaper articles from Vancouver, re fairly recent ones, describing the downtown east side as dangerous, talking about the downtown east side as mean, talking about it as falling to pieces, and talking about the potential death penalty for addicts. Here's another one uh, describing how we need to reactivate a major institution, a psychiatric hospital, to house all the people the downtown east side. And I'm not a techie person, but I have a, one little video on YouTube where there's a father who's describing how his son uh, died of a heroin overdose, Tony Trimingham, a, a well-known Australian father who came to Vancouver to help us with public education. And someone took the time to say uh, that essentially uh, we should give them all heroin with cyanide and save the working class some money. Here's another one on top where someone's talking about, uh, uh, this is another comment, that we should turn uh, the downtown east side into a drug addiction concentration camp. <clears throat> I show you these because Supervised injection takes place within a moral borderland. And the issues that we're talking about today are a part of that moral minefield. About 100 years ago in Vancouver and in British Columbia, we used to put people with leprosy on an island 18 miles off the coast of, uh, of Vancouver, where Insight is located. And they were there without services, without health care, just lepers and they would drop new lepers off there and the chief medical health officer would come and count the lepers and they would drop off supplies for them. When a leper died, a leper would bury a leper. And today it's a marine park. Um, there's just a little plaque there that, that describes the island. But the interesting part of it was that only Chinese Canadian lepers were put there. If you were a Euro-Canadian leper, uh, then you went to a hospital uh, where you received services and supports and visits from your family. And it was run by the nuns at the time who were like nurses who founded Montreal. So the point I want to make here is that in our experience, the people that we have, uh, have dealt with and tried to provide services for and supports in our community, including supervised injection, <coughs> are essentially social lepers. They've been socially constructed to be the lepers of our society in, in Canada. There are a number of different terms for this. Um, one of them is sequestering, and that's the idea that you hide away certain issues that are controversial. Uh, historically, like criminality, like sexuality, like HIV and AIDS, like cancer. Uh, another one is, is Similar concept is talking about uh, social erasures, 
sometimes things that are unsaid are more powerful than what are said. And an example of that would be if you have a relative who injures their knee in a ski accident and your neighbor asks you how they're doing, you would tell them, well, they had a pin put in their leg and doing quite well. But if, if you have a relative who has schizophrenia, then it's a different thing and there's an erasure. People aren't quite sure what to say and they might not ask you again. And essentially, people with addictions, uh, based on our 20 years of providing healthcare services uh, for people in little SROs, have socially tarnished identities, and they're at some level considered not quite human. So a big part of insight for us was to bring an extremely marginalized group of people into the doorway of healthcare, but also into the doorway of humanity. The first Supreme Court decision that Liz made reference to was the Pitfield decision, and it was very funny because he was so conservative, I expected him to arrive on a mule or a donkey uh, with a shotgun. I think he called them a blunderbuss here. Uh, and he, ironically, completely understood the supervised injection facility, uh, ironic to us at the time. And one of the things that he addressed, and this is one of those little erasures, one of those controversial parts of supervised injection that I wanted to highlight here, and I think you have to take head on when you deal with these issues if you're going to establish robust harm reduction services in a community, and that is that you're directly providing health care, but it is not with abstinence. And that's a controversial point that you have to get over or get around. It doesn't mean that you don't support recovery, it doesn't mean that it isn't a doorway potentially to recovery, but the initial intervention of keeping someone alive in a supervised injection facility or providing them with a needle, I know you have robust needle exchange in this uh, city, does not demand abstinence. And that is a controversial point in the beginning. One of the strategies that we used to try to, to establish supervised injection was that we directly humanized people with addictions. So we brought, uh, like I say, Tony Trimingham, a father who lost his son um, to a heroin overdose, and people with addictions and, and professionals all together as part of public education events like this one, churches and restaurants all over the place in the city. And we tried to essentially make the case that, this is obvious to most people here today, I'm sure, but that no one deserves to die because they're an addict, and that everyone is someone's son or daughter, mother, brother, sister. And this was a very powerful educational tool at the time. We also engaged a lot of family members uh, in promoting the idea that supervised injection was a part of the, the puzzle, one of the tools in the tool belt and this is a mother, a famous mother, uh, famous to us on the downtown east side, a feisty character. Uh, she's no longer alive. Uh, she just died this last year. But she had a son with a heroin addiction and another son with a mental illness. And she contrasted their experiences and in her public education. And here was a poster that she did and, and a, a family support uh, group that she set up. And it essentially said that you know, while I don't in approve of, of drug use, if heroin maintenance, as you have here, we don't have it in Canada, um, and supervised injection facilities will keep my son alive, then I support them. And this was very powerful in reaching part of the target group, but also in, in addressing this underlying cultural value that people have a concern about supervised injection sometimes around, which is that you're somehow throwing in the towel, that it's somehow enabling drug addiction, that it's somehow encouraging it. <clears throat> Liz made reference to the um, incredible level of overdose deaths that we had in our, um, our province. It culminated with a 400 person per year uh, overdose death rate, which is over, over 400 preventable heroin overdoses. And so we 
in part working with other stakeholders and partners like the local health authority and other agencies created a public problem. And I think this is another important strategy when you're trying to establish something like this is to essentially show that the problem is so severe that it demands government intervention. It demands, and by that I mean public resources, funding, money, and attention. Sort of like in Canada, drunken driving. It's a public problem. It's something that's best addressed with government resources. I just wanted to highlight uh, one point about the research. Unquestionably, our injection facility is the most rigorously evaluated injection facility in the world. I think it's probably the most rigorously evaluated healthcare project in the history of Canada. I mean, imagine spending, Liz said three million, depending on your estimates um, and what you include in that, I would say it would be closer to six million dollars was spent just simply evaluating it. The injection facility reached the target group, prevented fatal overdoses. It wasn't a tree that grew to heaven, but it was one of the tools in the tool belt. Reduced fatal overdoses, reduced HIV, reduced dangerous syringe injecting. And the other part that was ironic and is worth highlighting again is that we didn't expect this. I certainly didn't. But it increased people's referral into detox, it increased their referral into treatment. And if you came into treatment or detox, detox via Insight, your retention rate, your success rate was higher than if you'd come through another realm. All of these research studies, and, and Liz talked about it as a research partnership, and I want to just make it clear, we consider them partners now in the sense of having gone through this journey together of a decade, but they were actually an independent research team from a hospital and a university. It was an independent evaluation, uh, and we had no control over it or input into it. Um, and they chose the highest level of, of review evaluation, which was the peer-reviewed model. So not only did it get reviewed and evaluated, it got peer-reviewed into um, journals like The Lancet. Uh, and as I say, these are some of the findings uh, that it showed. And each of the findings, uh, what, what was particularly interesting is they all addressed one of these narratives that we have to concern ourselves about if we're agencies or funders trying to establish something like this. Does it encourage drug use? Does it encourage public disorder? Um, this sort of thing. And so each of the studies examined that very carefully. There's no more need for a scientific pilot to prove that supervised injection is, is efficacious any more than there is to show needle exchange is efficacious. It's been done. So if people are waiting for a gigantic research budget to do it, my, my view is you don't need it, which is controversial to some of the academics, but that's our experience. So just to uh, summarize a few of the analytical tools that we use, Liz made reference to this. Um, the same thing goes with, you know, do you need a position paper, policy document to move this forward? My view is no, but maybe. <laughs> so it can be helpful. So we had this four pillar approach. And what that really did is it allowed all these different stakeholders with different ideologies, different points of view, different experiences to get in, into the tent together. So you say, instead of a three-legged dog or a three-legged chair, you have a four-pillar approach, which includes the police prevention, treatment, harm reduction. It's an analytical tool so that we can see that everyone can come in, you know, into, into the same uh, tent and solve a social problem from their angle. The truth is, is anyone who's spend a lot of time thinking about this, we'll see, is that they aren't really distinct from one another. Treatment is a doorway, and you know, harm reduction can be a doorway into treatment. There can be treatment which is harm reduction based. I can tell you about some of our other programs besides this if you're interested in that regard. The police distribute and use Narcan in some of the United States, in New Mexico, for example. You know, seat belts are harm reduction, they don't stop. Um, speeding or poor driving, but so these things are actually don't really exist independently. But having an analytical tool 
can, uh, can assist you in getting people to dialogue. The first person who ever used Insight uh, was a person uh, by the name of Michel uh, Chartrand, and he was a very uh, much loved member of our community, lived in one of our hotels, well, in our, the hotel that we began with, Portland Hotel. That's why our name's the Portland Hotel. And as Liz said, our hotels are very modest. They're not like the Royal Marriott. And the injection facility came too late for him. He died. Uh, succumb to AIDS-related illnesses. But when he died, he had his we had his memorial in that church. And I'll never forget, you know, I, I, I can only imagine this could only ever happen in the downtown east side of Vancouver in that church. But the pastor, when he began the service, the first thing he did was he put his head down. He said, I want everyone to pray and thank God for the injection facility. I thought, where am I ever going to hear that again? And just before we received an extension on one of our exemptions, so what was happening with our exemption? We got a three-year exemption from the country's federal drug law to have an injection facility. And then we got another three-year one. And then when the conservative government came in, it became very politicized, which is the first time that had happened, because in Canada, the federal government is not actively involved in providing health care. They just give money to the province. It would be like giving money to Bristol. And the province delivers the health care. And they don't normally take an active interest in a clinic or something. But the prime minister took an active interest in the clinic and wanted it shut down. So we started getting limited extensions, six months, this sort of thing and not knowing the fate of it. And in many ways, that's how governments uh, maintain that kind of master-servant relationship with funders, as, as many of you will know, is by just letting the funding go this distance and not guaranteeing it. So with nine days left before we lost our exemption, and at which point you're imagining, and, and Liz gave you some high-level numbers, we had 20,000 injections a month in Insight give you a sense of how many people are using the facility during 18 hours, okay? 11,000 registrants, people who make use of it. So here we are wondering what's gonna happen. Are we gonna shut it down? What's gonna happen? And I was driving through the downtown east side and I saw that church. And on the marquee was that sign, save the safe injection site this Sunday's worship. And again, I, I thought it just seemed so surreal to see such a thing. I, I ran home and I, I had a, I just got one of those SLR cameras, the first time I'd ever had one, and I took four pictures. And then a couple of years later, the researchers asked if they could have a copy of the paper, I mean of the picture. And they used it in a journal, The Lancet, in one, in one of their articles, and a about six months later, I received a check in the mail for $100. And so now I'm a professional photographer. <laughs> so I was saying earlier to, uh, to Danny, uh, I, he was asking what are the things, we were talking about what are the things you need to establish an injection facility. And in the early days, Insight, we needed the same things. We needed the chief of police. We needed the mayor. Um, you needed whole bunch of different stakeholders to endorse it. And within Canada, our police are not as supportive as harm, of harm reduction as I think they are here more open to it. In Canada, it's almost against the religion of the enforcement community. I know my father was an RCMP officer, um, which is like the federal Mountie, you know, and he was very much against harm reduction for many years. And getting a letter from the chief of police was unbelievable when we got that letter. Uh, it was very powerful. But today, in my mind, given where we're at uh, with uh, Insight and the Supreme Court decision where it's the law, it's the law now. That's, it, you know, that injection, supervised injection facility is allowed, right, in Canada. I don't think we need the chief of police anymore. I think that it's absurd to, in our context, to be looking for a letter of support for, from the chief of police to open up a cancer agency. 
or a mental health clinic or a supervised injection facility. I think we've moved past that. It's healthcare matter. But the three things you need is you need bureaucratic will. And by that, I mean you need funders who are going to fund it, whatever your health authority is here locally. And people on the inside of bureaucracies have to take real risk to do that. It happened in our community to do programs like this, which are perceived as controversial. Secondly, you need um, to have some political will. But by political will, really, you don't need David Cameron to come out supporting this. You just need the politicians, in our experience, to, to step out of the way and let it happen. You don't even necessarily need a champion. You just need a health minister or someone to allow it to exist. And I think one of the most difficult things to get in place to get this done now, at least in Canada, is to have the community capacity on the ground, to have an agency, a nonprofit organization that has the capacity and the courage to do it. So for example, if I were going to set one up in Bristol, the first thing I'd be doing would be talking to an agency on the ground, looking for a place to start it, looking for a landlord, a lease, a permit for opening up a health care program. Where do you get the needles? Where do you get the equipment? The more practical things on the ground are equally as important as the bureaucratic will and the political will. But it's the piece that's often missing. A couple more points and then I'm done and we can have some questions if you're interested. So the one, I think one of the spectacular issues of this case where we won at the Supreme Court of Canada, and we really were scared to bring it there. Because when you go into the legal realm, you're really playing the ponies, right? What we found was that one of the, the crucial aspects of the case was that essentially, morality is not enough to stand in the way of supervised injection as part of the standard of care. So Liz, remember, told you that there were two arguments in the case. One was that this is the jurisdiction of the province. It'd be a bit like saying this is the jurisdiction of Bristol, so federal government can't do anything about it. The other argument was by virtue of prohibiting a person who's an IDU, an injection drug user, from having access to supervised injection, you are putting them in harm's way. You're, you're sacrificing the security of their person under the Constitution of Canada, which is the first article of the Constitution of Canada. What, what the Supreme Court decided was that they wouldn't comment on either of those two things. They just said, give, give us the permit now. Give them the permit immediately, because the regulatory system exists there to give them the permit. And one of the things that they determined was that a minister of the Crown cannot withhold a permit arbitrarily. It's not allowed. And the other piece for me, which was um, even more, um, I think even more powerful, was that in many ways it validated the personhood of people who make use of insight to receive service. In Canada today, even the most marginalized homeless person with active drug addiction issues is a citizen. And they have fundamental rights to life-saving health care. The other piece that this showed, and, I, and this is my more controversial point that we're making in Canada and we're making in some other jurisdictions like this one, is that I think we've reached a point when it comes to supervised injection in the world where it's part of the standard of care. It is not a pilot. It's not a research program. If you don't have supervised injection of some sort, and there are a number of different types, there's the one in a facility, you know, where if you're in, the, if you live in the facility, there can be supervised injections in there. There are roving supervised injection uh, models, but nonetheless, if you are not accounting for the need for supervised injection. I think there's what we call in Canada a risk management problem for government. I think they're vulnerable. I think they're morally 
ethically, legally, and health authorities as well are vulnerable because, they, because we know it can save lives and they're not providing it, then I think that they're vulnerable. And so the point that we make these days is that um, if the epidemiological variables demand supervised injection, then you need it. And it's simple enough, you know, sometimes people debate this. I come into communities and in Canada too, and they debate, well, should we have them in four injection facilities or 10, or should there be one here or there? Those issues are practical ones that need to be solved on the ground, but they don't allow you to sidestep the responsibility of needing supervised injection. And the first question to ask is, how many people die of overdoses in Bristol? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't work here, but you know, if there are people dying of preventable overdoses, then there's a standard of care issue and supervised injection has to be a part of it. The final little point I want to make, it's my final slide, um, speaks to this issue of sort of personhood of people with addictions. Because <clears throat> a, lo a lot of our services are people, for people are housing. The injection facility is actually a tiny part of what we do. Mostly we're doing housing and other health care. And there's a literature I was reading 20 years ago uh, about self-fulfilling prophecies. And it started with a, a famous study called Pygmalion in the Classroom. Has anybody heard of that? Anyway, the Pygmalion in the Classroom study was where some important researchers came into a classroom and they gave a group of children an intelligence test, a whisker, a Weschler intelligence scale revised for children, and they shared the results with the teachers and they said, these students are going to be the early bloomers, they're gonna do really well, that's our, our guess, and these students are the late bloomers, they're gonna take a little longer. And then they came back in six months, and sure enough, their test was entirely predictive. The ones they said were early bloomers were early bloomers, the ones they said were late bloomers were late bloomers, but the, of course, as you can anticipate, there was no test. It was pretend. It wasn't a wish layer at all. They randomized the students to, they gave them a test, but they randomized them. So since that time, there have been over 400 of these studies that have shown the power of self-fulfilling prophecies. And it's my view and my experience uh, working uh, where we, we do is that people with addictions um, are very much aware of the, the values that we, we implot upon them. And so one of the things that we're always encouraging as part of our work um, is uh, reflection about that. Even in more recent uh, studies of self-fulfilling prophecies, elementary school children can tell within 10 seconds, it's a study I put there, whether a teacher thinks they're going to be successful or not, whether, and whether they think they're smart. They don't think of it quite that way, though they think of it in terms of whether the teacher loves them or not. So that's everything that we have to say today. Are there any questions? Well, there are a number of different variations of that law and that concern. Um, and it so often, I think, comes down to interpretation. Like when we first started an injection, started looking at launching an injection facility, there was no law in favor of it. And so in those days, we were terrified what's going to happen, right? So we set up a nonprofit society that was like a shadow society. I spoke to all my friends and family and said, hey, we're going to do this. Don't know what's going to happen. Are we going to be prosecuted? Our lawyers said, yes, you will be prosecuted. You will, people will go to jail over this. Um, and in fact, interestingly, as a roundabout way to answering your question, I was also invited to the US consulate. And this sounds like a very like crazy conspiracy theory, but there's a WikiLeak on it. 
so you can you can look it up if you're interested. There's a WikiLeak about me going to the U.S. consulate, and when I went there, the U.S. consulate, the guy who was there from the U.S. president's office, Dr. David Murray, said, "Don't get me wrong, sovereignty is important, but." If you continue down this road, there will be consequences. If you think the United States is going to sit by and look. So we didn't really know what's going to really happen. And so I think it's really important to explore all the risk management on your end in terms of what the legalities are, um, whether it's possession of drug paraphernalia, which I know is a concern in this area around nurses being prosecuted for holding needles or like people you know, people worry about these things, or whether it's um, opening up a supervised injection facility, you need to be, you know, well-resourced in terms of legal opinions. But my experience, and again, we don't, I don't live in Britain, right, so I don't know, but my experience in Canada was that our fears were larger than the risk because at the end of the day, you know, like, and one of the things we did is, is we got a lawyer. Um, and in the early days, I went to a Supreme Court, a former Supreme Court judge, and asked him if he would be the lawyer. He said, no, <laughs> no. So then he put me on to a young lawyer who was an activist. And I said, well, I like that lawyer, but I want, we want someone who's like really scary to the establishment. And so we ended up getting a lawyer. He said, well, okay, I'll make a, re I'll make a referral. So I went to see this lawyer who, who represented the tobacco companies. I never met him before, and I said, hey, I showed him a little video of the inside of the injection facility when it was illegal. It wasn't open yet, but it was, no one knew about it except him and 10 other people. We called it the hair salon in those days. And I showed it to him and he looked, and I, and I had a picture, a little video, 30 seconds of my son who was five years old explaining what an injection facility was based on having heard his dad talk. I said, well, I just filmed them randomly. And he looked at me and he said, Dan, you're on the right side of the law on this. I give you my word, no one's gonna go to jail. But if you can get a permit, wait for the permit. Each situation is different. But you know, in Canada, we had s the same kinds of concerns. I don't, I don't believe that at the end of the day, because we also had to think about it if we lost the permit. Because one thing that was gonna happen, if we, lo if we lost the court case, which we didn't know, so hence all those people standing on the streets and everything, literally, it was closing that morning at 10 o'clock. Hypothetically, so we had to think also in that case what will happen and our health authority had already told us that they would shut it the police had or the, the chief of police had told me um, Hey Dan a Policeman's job is simple. It's either for against the law or it's not I Won't want to but I'll shut it down So at the end of the day, you know, we had to anticipate what would happen and we would have kept it open we would have attempted to. I don't know how long you can do that without funding and everything else. But So I think those are real issues you have to wrestle with, and I don't know the legal dynamics here, but I don't think they're insurmountable. Uh, you know, it's my view that if, if it's something that's important, then you have to sometimes push a little bit, waiting for, as some of our communities in Canada do, waiting for permission without pushing a little bit doesn't really tend to deliver controversial services on the ground. Well, it's interesting because in the beginning, there was no funding. We, had, we cobbled together $30,000. So that would be about, what, 14,000 or 16,000 pounds or something at the time, I don't know. $30,000, and we built kind of like an IKEA version of an injection facility. You have IKEA here, you know? So, and there were many thoughts about where we're gonna put it. Like, is it gonna be in a church, which is one place, you know, we thought, or where's it gonna be symbolically? So we built a symbolic one. It was totally functional. 
for $30,000, and there were different people that donated, including me, like just a little bit of money, everybody, and lots of in-kind stuff, and we built it secretly. I signed a lease with a private sector person who owns the injection facility building to this day, a business person on the ground who works in the poor area. I don't know where the poor area is here, but it, he ran a pizza shop, and he lived on the second floor with his family, and he had a rooming house on the third floor. So I said, hey, we want to do this. Here's, can we sign a lease? Signed a three-year lease with an option to put a detox on the second floor and treatment on the third, which is what's there today. But we had no money. So we had to take a leap of faith, and, and that's where, when it comes to capacity of an organization, we signed the lease without the money. But on the inside, interestingly, we had a bureaucrat, two bureaucrats who were supportive of it. And one of them made a kind of a handshake deal with us and said, I said, I'm going to sign this lease. And she said, go for it. One way or another, we'll help you out, make sure you're not vulnerable. The initial cost was 30000 but there to build it infrastructurally, but there was a lot of risk associated with it financially. And by the end of the day, you know, to run an injection facility properly with nurses and everything else, it's more like a million dollars a year. So you need, you need the government behind you to have 20,000 injections a month and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and treatment and detox and everything. Other questions? Um, I think there are a num number of different ways to kind of crack that nut. Um, my sense is now that the easiest, um, or the most logical variable is, is overdose death and, and uh, the spread of infectious diseases, syringe sharing, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes people start splitting cumin seeds and they start arguing, well, you know, we're dealing with that quite well with syringe distribution and we're doing this and that. At, at some level, I think um, one of the things about a supervised injection facility, the subtler point that I want to make here is that you're also creating a huge window to bring people who are otherwise not connected to healthcare into healthcare. So sometimes what we've talked about in Canada is, okay, let's just have these discrete drug consumption rooms, like we've got one um, in a program called the Dr. Peters Center, which is for people living with AIDS. So in that, you've got, I don't know, let's say 50 people living in that building. And some of them are injection drug users. So when someone wants to use, to inject drugs, they come and they speak to the staff. The staff go and open up the injection room, which is also another room. The nurse sits and reads a magazine, and you use. And when you're done, you leave. There's a need for that, right? But there's also, if you have a certain, pop, a certain element of people who are disconnected to healthcare, and this is the subtler point for the work of the Portland, is that there's a whole group of people, the social lepers, who are completely forgotten and marginalized and disenfranchised from a whole bunch of services. They're not allowed in restaurants, they're not allowed in community centers, they're not allowed in housing, they're I could go on and on. Dental care, et cetera. So I see the injection facility also as a doorway welcoming people into healthcare. And for that, you don't, you don't need only, I don't think, an, epi uh, an epidemic or a pandemic of, uh, in, of HIV or hepatitis or overdose. I think those are part of the picture, and I think that's a risk management piece for healthcare providers and, and people who are decision makers and funders, perhaps in this room, you know, one of the tools in their tool belt. But it's not only that. I think it can be subtler than that. And the case that's most important for me that I'm interested in expanding uh, and we're interested in expanding in Canada is the supervised inhalation part. So in the inhalation part, you don't have as much of an epidemiological case, some might argue, for hepatitis or HIV being spread by cracked pipes and stuff, right? But you do, but you could argue, but, and maybe there aren't as many overdoses. So then someone says, well, then we don't need it. 
But if we've got 8,000 crack smokers in the inner city of downtown Eastside, and then there's a, I think there's a healthcare need to bring that population into a health, the doorway of healthcare. So in my view, in that case, the healthcare case is already there just by virtue of the fact that you're disconnecting people. Bring them in. Well, to begin with, you know, everyone's a hero in their own story, and today the story we're telling um, has not focused on the drug user community and the work that's been done in the downtown east side, which has been immense and incredible. The story in itself is a group called the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, and they used to fall under our umbrella. It used to be my responsibility to administer their contract. Bandu, yeah. And a big part of what they did was they were, in my mind, the kind of the sand in the oyster shell. They were the advocates that pushed for a pearl. And in part, they humanized the issue of addiction the other part that they did that I thought was revolutionary in Canada was that it showed that active drug users, not only people in recovery like some of the people in this room, but active drug users could provide healthcare interventions. This was unbelievable and Health Canada federally would not allow it at the time. We have active drug users working in Insight and in our needle exchange. This is not only people who are in recovery, this is people who are explicitly right off the street working there. It's a story in itself, right? But the one thing I wanna point out in my mind, uh, which is the more, I'll make a more controversial point than I have today. I don't know if any of this is controversial or not, but. So if you stack up all of the evidence in favor of something like a supervised injection facility, the truth is it doesn't matter that much because policymakers can choose to ignore it. And that's exactly what, this, what Stephen Harper did. He ignored it. And then what he, our prime minister, and then what he did is he funded more research, kept pulling the slot machine to fund more researchers to see if he could get a negative study. So coming back to this issue of confidence intervals and stuff, I, I think that you can use research as one of the tools in the tool belt but it isn't a sufficient condition to get anything done, whether it's early childhood education programs or daycare, or, you know, and, and one of the things I say to researchers sometimes is sort of what happens when all the research is there and the policymakers ignore it, what are you gonna do now? So my bullet um, list is that at some level, one, you have to try to build a coalition of people and stakeholders and like-minded people that want sensible solutions to social problems, whatever they may be. But more than that, I, and this is where the drug user community sometimes comes in, I think, is that as controversial as this seems, I think sometimes you have to be involved in an aggressive advocacy campaign. And you ha actually have to do it. You know, so rather than discussing forever and ever and ever and ever, coming up with the best policy and the best plan, sometimes somebody, there's a big pile of gravel over there and we're talking about the best way to move it. Sometimes someone needs to take a shovel and start digging. And I, I think that if whatever the initiative is, whether it's an eating disorder clinic or a supervised injection facility, sometimes we spend too much time planning. And at some point we have to move past that. So my bullet form, list really comes down to being in the Department of Social Doing, not Social Planning. So if I were wanting to do this, um, I would literally be looking around this neighborhood to see where the best place was. And I would be talking to a landlord and putting the equipment together and talking to the board of directors and getting the drug users lined up. And, and the other piece is once you get rolling, we haven't talked about the practical mechanics of operating an injection facility. It's another thing altogether. But you need to have buy-in. And one of the ways that you get buy-in and reach the target group, because the magic of what the Portland has done over the years, our only credibility, you know, really in my view, it's sort of two things. One is that we will fight. And so we have a, a good relationship with funders, but also 
complicated one. We don't fight all the time. We don't fight for the sake of the fight. But sometimes we'll draw a line in sand and say, this fights to the death, metaphorically. And the second thing that we've, I think the most, and that's something relatively recent in terms of people, us being backed into the corner so that we have been forced to fight out in the open against the prime minister, basically. But the second and most important thing that we do, and I think this is where drug users can assist with an injection facility and getting established, is we, we've worked really hard, there's another talk I give about what we do actually, this isn't it, to try to lower the threshold to remove barriers in services to try to build services that were, that were made for the people that are in front of us, not for people that haven't been born yet. And I think that that magic, how do, you, how do you build a truly inclusive program so that anyone can come in and use it and they aren't chased away implicitly, explicitly by bureaucratic rules? I think that is, at the end of the day, um, a key role for the drug user community. The number one bullet for me is to find an agency that has the capacity and the guts to do it on the ground. I'd find, I don't know who it is here, but if you want to do it, then you have to find an organization that has the capacity and the courage to do it. And then I'd be working with them on the practical details and moving ahead. Someone asked me a question earlier today um, about, well, is this the right climate? given David Cameron and the Conservatives. And I, and I thought, I think, and this is an arrogant thing for me to say because I don't live here, right? But I'll say it for the fun of it, is that there really is never an ideal climate. There wasn't an ideal climate in Canada. I mean, whether it was the Labour Party or the Conservatives or the Republicans or whatever you want to call them, nobody was reaching behind their desk for the permit to give us for an injection facility. It's a 10-year battle, any of these things that are complicated, right, or five or 10 years to get anything done. So as part of that, you have to just, it's humble work tilling the soil. And you waiting for politicians to show leadership is, you know, is, you know uh, can be like waiting for a valentine that never comes, sometimes, with rare exceptions. <laughs>